I'm doing well. So uh, uh, we now are you going to be? <laughs> sorry, I'm just outside. We just had a fire alarm. So um, excuse me. <laughs> is throw things over to you, and uh, you can get started with the talk. We're broadcasting now, so it'll take a second for everybody to get uh, to get the feed. But feel free to. Use slides if you prefer at some sections of the talk, or if you'd like to producing yourself a bit in the kind of work that you do. I'll do an informal introduction just quickly to let folks know why we've got you here for our course this week. Okay. Um, so Tony Hurst is one of those folks that I've known for several years, and he was actually, and he, he's actually our first keynote at the. Uh, learning analytics conference that we had a few years ago and uh, that was the one we had in Banff and since then uh, he's continued to be very active in a range of different aspects around uh, teaching, learning and the use of analytics but what I think I find most interesting with your work Tony is the fact that you have a significant amount of interest in just the use analytics and this is from the perspective of analytics for anyone who prefers to just hack and play around rather than formal structured activities. So on that note, I'm going to actually just turn this over to you. You're with the Open University, Tony, and I know a few years ago when I was visiting the center, one of the things I found interesting was there was a coffee table book at about Open University successes, and I think about three or four of the articles that were listed were featuring you. So obviously you've made a significant impact in the culture locally as well with your interest in in this topic. So on that note, I'm going to turn it over to you, Tony, and you can take it away. Okay. Doc. Okay, so have I got the feed? Does this look nice? I can still see George. I'm not sure that... Have I got the feed? Yeah, I'm currently not seeing your diet or your screen, Tony. No, hang on. Um, give it another go. Is this any better? Do you have my screen now? Any better, George? Can you give me the thumbs up? Yay, good. So, have you got my conversations with data slides? Yes, good. Right, so um, what I was going to do, I was going to talk about some um, a strategy for, for working with data that works with analytics data but work with other flavors of data. Um, I've styled it conversations with data um, and I'll explore a little bit about what that means and, and some of my attitudes towards data and how we can actually work with it. Now I see this in part as um, recognizing and addressing a skills gap and this is a skills gap associated with um, the skills that people need in order to be able to work with data effectively. For most people who use data, um, the environment they, they do so is likely to be a spreadsheet, an Excel spreadsheet typically. And this is not necessarily the best sort of tool to work with data, um, although it is one of the most general. Um, and I think one of the, the issues we've got to start addressing is getting people up to a skills level where they can start to work with um, powerful data tools, data analysis tools, data visualization tools, and data wrangling tools, so that they can make the most of the data that they've got to work with. Now, I came across a quote a couple of days ago from John Tukey, um, a statistician from several decades ago, right at the start of, of computer use within statistics and within visualizations. And Tukey came up with the notions of um, exploratory data analytics. And writing in 1965, so um, 50 years ago now, 
at the dawn of computing in statistics, he said that, that one of the things that computers would allow people to do is become journey, journeyman carpenters of data analytical tools, by which I think he had the attitude that people would be able to start developing their own tools and working with their own, um, their own fashion tools to work with the data sets. And these tools would be fashioned using computers, computer software and computer hardware. Now, as uh, George mentioned, I like playing with things. Um, I quite like getting my hands dirty with data and with data wrangling tools. And I'm not going to talk so much about the details or specifics in this presentation, um, although on my blog, you can useful info, you can find many recipes and examples of how I work with tools. Um, so in this talk, I'm going to focus a little bit more on um, my attitude towards data analysis and the tools that we have available to us. And again, quoting from Tukey, um, he sees exploratory data analysis as an attitude, a flexibility to work with tools and to work with data, um, an emphasis on using visualizations to actually look at data sets, not just run statistical, uh, mathematical statistics, but also run visual statistics. Um, and Visualization plays a large part in the, the approach that I take to working with data. So one final um, quote, and, and this one will give anyone listening or viewing a bit of channel conflict as you try to read this quote while I, I also talk over it. This comes from Lee Wilkinson, who developed um, an approach of using graphics called the grammar of graphics. And he, he was writing in this book in 1999 about the tools that we have available to us and his attitude like Tukey is that we shouldn't be afraid to give users powerful tools um, even if they aren't necessarily well versed in statistics. Um, there are lots of tools out there, powerful tools. This tool that I'm using tonight, um, presentation tools, is a powerful tool. Um, it can be used badly, um, can be used well, but these powerful tools we should all have available to us and we should all make the most of them. So I'm going to show you some powerful tools that I think we should make available to anyone who wants to work with data, rather than just encouraging them to stick with a general purpose tool such as Google Sheets or um, Microsoft Excel. So when working with data uh, at a high level, I, I see two sorts of issues. And this, this works at a very general level, and we can apply this distinction going down to quite fine detailed problems as well. On the one hand, we've got issues of data accessibility. So at the top level, this means just how we get hold of data. Uh, there are lots of data sets out there. They're increasingly becoming available in the open data world, where I spend a lot of my time. But in institutions and organizations, lots of data sets are available. Um, although the, the format in which the data is made available may not be so easy for people to make use of. On the other hand, we've got issues of making sense of data, so data sense making. This is analyzing the data, finding stories in the data, and telling stories from data sets. If we slice across those, we've got four steps or four stages whenever we're working with a data set. Um, cleaning data sets, so making data sets, uh, taking data sets that we've found or discovered, getting them into a state where we can actually start working with them. Shaping data sets, which um, refers to getting the data into a physical shape where we can start to analyze it and ask questions using the tools that we have available to us. Augmenting data, which I'm not going to talk about so much today, but that relates to linking two or more data sets together. So we're taking different data sets and then merging them on common columns or column features. Um, and finally, looking at data, the ways in which we can actually visually explore a data set to try to learn something from it. Now, this may involve going back and cleaning the data more, or more likely it will involve reshaping the data and augmenting the data so we can get a better look at it. And I'll, I'll say I'll cover most of those, all the cleaning, shaping, and looking um, within this presentation. So if we're going to clean data, that implies that we've got dirty data. Um, so dirty data is data, well, dirty data data that, that comes in a variety of forms, real forms, that make it difficult to work with. Um, so I've given some examples on that slides there. Dates are a big problem whenever you're working with a data set, particularly data set you've found. 
The same date can be represented in multiple ways, particularly within spreadsheets where a, a column is used as a set of characters rather than an actual date. So the 10th of March 2014 might be represented as 3 minus 10, 14, or it might be re represented as 10 slash 3 slash 14. These different statements all refer to the same date, but a computer doesn't know that necessarily. If we're trying to search for a date or do datey things with that data, US gun policy. Um, um, tweet from George there. So we have da different d data represented in different ways. That actually means the same thing. And one, one of the stages we would go through in cleaning a data set would be putting dates into date formats so that we are actually talking about a date as a datey thing where the computer knows that, that it is this particular point in time rather than a set of characters. We also get numbers. Um, numbers are numbers. Numbers are numbers in spreadsheets. When numbers are numbers in spreadsheets, we can add them up, take them away, do sums with them. When numbers are presented in a form that's more intelligible to, to us, so that example on the screen, an amount of um, just over a billion um, pounds, We've got a pound sign getting in the way, we've got a comma getting in the way, and we've got a magnitude amount, million, getting in the way. That isn't a number that a computer would recognize, although we could start to build parsers that could read it as such. But that's the sort of data that we get in a lot of data sets, numbers that are represented as other things. And when we're cleaning a data set, we've got to bring to various tools to bear to help us get these messy strings into things that are actually numbers where we can start doing sums with them. We also get lots of missing characters, and there's different sorts of missing data. Data might be missing because it doesn't exist. It might be missing because we don't have access to it. Missing data can be represented in different ways in different systems. And whenever we're working with a data set, we have to, first of all, identify those data elements that might be missing, and then work out what sort of missing they might mean, because there are different sorts of missing. Sometimes it may or may not be clear whether or not we've got a data point that's, that, that's missing because we haven't got access to it or it's missing because it doesn't exist. Part of the issue with cleaning dirty data is that we don't necessarily have access to the person who's clean, who, who originated that data, and this can um, further add to our issues when trying to make sense of it. So one of the tools that I use for trying to tidy up data sets, or tabular data sets in particular, is a tool called OpenRefine. Um, this can be downloaded from openrefine.org. It um, runs across platforms. It runs as a service that you access through a web browser. Um, and what it allows you to do is, is work with a single tabular data set and um, do a variety of, of row and column based operations on it. So it's particularly good at column based operations. I've given an example on the screen there which shows the opening, um, the opening page of OpenRefine, and it shows that you can load in a wide variety of, of data formats into this tool. So we can load in CSV files, we can load in um, Excel files in a variety of formats, we can load in XML files as well. RDF files are, are data that come from linked data sources, typically, and we could also load in JSON files, so this is JavaScript um, object notation data, data that's made available through a wide variety of APIs. Um, so we can load data into OpenRefine, we can get it into a tabular format where we can start to, to clean it and process it. Um, and what I'll do now is just show you some of the various uh, tools that, or sub-tools that are offered through OpenRefine. Um, these tools apply down a column, so we can, we can um, load data sets into OpenRefine of several hundred thousand rows, it happily works with, depending on the speed of your computer. And we can apply different operations down, um, down a column or across multiple columns. So facetting tools um, provide ways of, of looking at different facets of the data. Um, in a categorical data column, so a column where we've got the names of different things, so it might be the names of individuals or the names of companies, um, for example, we can take a text facet which will pull out all the unique names, all the unique values down that column. Um, so this can be really a really handy tool for, for looking
you can generate text facets across multiple columns, um, which will give us the unique values for each of those different columns, and then we can filter our data set according to values we've selected through those text facets. So many of you will be familiar with the idea of facets from um, Amazon shopping, where you've got facets for different categories of goods, so it might be books or films. Um, we've got different categories in a separate um, faceted area, which might be the different genres of, of book or film title. And we can filter selectively within those different facets. Similarly, within OpenRefine, we can use different facets to, to filter down into our data sets. Um, we can edit cells on a, on a row basis, so we can apply transformations to each, each cell within a column, one cell at a time. So several common transforms are, um, are made available just by default within the tool, so we can trim white space at the start or end of a cell. Um, we can change the case within different um, within the cell elements. We convert things that are, are strings um, to numbers, we can convert things that are uh, strings or numbers to dates. Um, we can convert things to text. So we can we can make different type transformations um, to each cell within a column, and we can also apply our own transformations as well by writing a simple one line of, of Python code or the Google Refine Expression Language Grel code. We can apply transformations, programming-based transformations, on a per cell basis down a column. We can also fill all the cells. Um, if we've got blanks going down a column, we've got, got a, a row in a, a cell, then a series of blanks below it. We can fill that value down to fill in blanks, um, or we can just blank out a cell completely. We can also split cells that have got multiple values in them. So if we've got a comma-separated list of values within a column, we can separate out each of those comma-separated items into separate columns, which can be useful. And we can also join um, cells together. At the bottom of that list, there's a, a tool called Cluster and Edit, and this, this is a really handy set of tools for, for working with data sets. When we've got values, names of something in particular down a column, um, if this data has been entered manually by a person, it's quite likely that they will have entered words relating to the same name, the same person, the same company, the same thing, in slightly different ways. So this example here is a set of data from um, an exploration we did on um, the manufacture of garments in Bangladesh. We were looking at companies who were um, running the factories that produce these garments. And we see here lists of names of companies that are sort of similar. So at the top, AKH Stitch Art Limited, uh, two different versions there. The LTD at the end is represented differently. If we were doing an exact search on these company names, if the search was case sensitive, then we might miss some of those items. Looking down the list a little bit further, we see um, there's a there's difference in type. So, um, But we can also do string matching where uh, even more different words are, are matched. Um, I don't have a good example there, unfortunately. Um, so, those are cell edits we can apply. Um, we can also do um, operations to columns themselves, so we can rename or, or move columns. We can add columns um, to the data set by fetching URLs. So this, this can be quite a handy way of annotating your data or extending your data. If you've got a list of URLs in this data set, we can use those URLs to go and fetch HTML pages or, or data from APIs into additional columns within, within the tool. We can also construct URLs based around cell contents so um, to pull data in from online data services. So if we've got a, an online data service that takes in or, or that accepts the name of a company, for example, and returns a set of company information, we can construct an, a URL that calls that API from the values contained within a column generate the URLs, go off and get the data, and then put that into additional cells within this data set. We can transpose data within the tool, um, and we can reconcile data. Reconciliation is a linked data technique, so a semantic web linked data technique, where we can take cell values within a column, and we can, we can look them up on the web, and we can pull back additional information about them. Um, 
Now, when working with data sets, um, the shape of data often influences to a very great extent what we can actually do with a data set. Um, so, oh, the slide hasn't rendered properly here. This is a shame. The top blank cell there um, should have an example of a data set where we've got rows of data that are in what is called a wide format. The data set that I've used as an example actually is um, examples of um, Formula One race results. And in this top cell at the top where the image hasn't converted properly, um, we should have a wide data format where we have the name of a driver and then we have the different columns for different races. So we'd have a column for the race results for a race in Australia, a column for the race results in Bahrain, a column for the race results in Malaysia, and so on. So that, that's a wide data format. And lots of, lots of data sets are published in a wide format. It can be hard to work with. So as an example of reshaping the data set, we can do a transformation that's known as a melt operation. This is a melt done using um, the R programming language, which takes these separate columns and melts them and puts them into rows. So in the original data set, I would have had a column for results in Australia by the name of the driver, a column for results in Bahrain, a column for results in Malaysia. By melting the data, we can pull all those separate columns down into a single column that identifies the race, which would have been the original column name, and then the value from each of those columns applied along the row. So when the data is in this longer form, it quite often becomes easier to work with, particularly when, when generating charts. Um, there are other times where we may want the data in the wide format. And again, we can do a reverse operation where we would take this melted data, and we could go down the rate column, and we could say, for each unique value in this column, I want to generate a column and then put in the associated position value. So we can transform the shape of data sets very flexibly using powerful tools, uh, using computational tools, by writing down the transformations we want. Um, so in my original wide data set, I took, I took the drivers as the key and melted all the other data sets. Um, by, by transforming the data, we get data that we can use differently. Now this data set, when I see a data set that looks like that, a column of values, column of values, I actually see that as a hierarchical data set. I know through familiarization of working with data sets, as do many people who work with data sets, that we can represent this data in a hierarchical format. And a good tool, a visual tool for doing that, is a tree map. Um, so this is a tree map of um, medal awards in the Olympics. And this top left tree map, the top level, the, the big outer square, is the allocation of gold medals. Within each of those is um, a separate area of the tree map that shows the allocation of medals by country. So this was the allocation of medals to China. Then we have the allocation of medals below it to gold medals to the USA. And then in the middle, the allocation of gold medals to Korea. Within each country grouping, there is a further breakdown of the number of goals that was awarded to each particular country within a particular sport. So badminton, weightlifting, and diving were good gold medal halls for China. Um, the USA got a large number of medals for swimming um, and cycling and rowing. The size of the squares is, um, rel is related to the number of medals that the country got in each of those disciplines, um, and the colour is, is a, not a very useful colour, but we could also use that to indicate um, the number of gold medals either in this um, Olympics or perhaps the previous Olympics, so we could show the difference in number, uh, the, whether or not the medal hall was increased or decreased from a previous Olympics by colour. Um, the same data set, exactly the same medal data set, was used to generate the other tree map, the one at the bottom right. And in this case, we've got um, the country as the top level. Um, and then within it, we've got um, the different disciplines. So here, in the top left of this second chart, the swimming um, discipline, we can see the medal hall for the USA, the medal hall for China, the medal hall for Australia. And we see that the USA won most of the medals in swimming. 
these medal tables actually are broken down by into three sections each of those medals the medals awarded for gold silver or bronze so at a glance within a particular discipline we can see relatively how many medals were awarded across the different disciplines then within a discipline we can see the country that got the largest medal haul and then within each country we can see the breakdown of, of the number of medals they got for gold, silver or bronze. So these hierarchical data, data sets, the same data set generated both of those, those visualizations simply by rearranging the order in which we take the columns and we map them onto different hierarchical layers of, of the tree. And one of the things that, that um, being able to work with data tools in a programmatic way um, it means that we can we can quite easily write descriptions for these charts and generate them and I'll give some examples of how to do that in a few slides time um, now these tree maps um, there is a, a tool called um, many eyes which is an old IBM tool um, available online that allows you to generate tree maps and through just changing the order of columns it will generate different views of the tree maps such as these two different views here this sort of dynamic is, is one that's uh, replicated um, and is very similar to the use of pivot tables and interactive pivot tables in many spreadsheet and data analysis tools. And uh, a pivot table tool that I've started exploring a lot quite lately comes from Nicholas Crutchton. Um, it's a JavaScript tool which um, provides an interactive, uh, an interactive pivot table. You load in a data set, a simple from a CSV file it could be, and it, it generates this interactive widget for you with the names of the columns provided um, along the top by default. And you can then click several uh, visualizations into this sorts of charts we can use to look at a data set um, and knowing which which chart to choose often depends on which you want to last. But not every chart will give you all the answers to, to the big questions you've got. Again, quoting Tukey, there's no more reason to ex expect one graph to tell all than to expect one number to do the same. So a number there might be a summary statistic. In many cases, we want to use a wide variety of visualization tools or techniques in order to get different views over a data set, in order to understand different things from it. So when we're looking at hierarchical data, for example, using a tree map, there may be different ways that we can take the same data and look at it in different ways to understand different things about it. And I'm going to move to a different thing because this image is not working. Um, I shall just find another window with the data in, hopefully. Okay. Hopefully, you should have I will not trust Google Slides again, I don't think. Um, so, Hopefully you should have, um, George, can I get a ping, a picture of my PowerPoint slide deck. Sure. Right now what I'm seeing or was seeing on your screen was if quantities are concerned. Yes, that's the one. Um, okay, that's what I'm okay. seeing. I uh, should have stuck with the uh, PowerPoint. Okay, so, um, so this is a, a representation of a data set that we could display as a tree map. But here, the, the quant it, we've got a set of quantities that are conserved, which is, I'm using Formula One sports data again, um, which is points allocation. And, and in Formula One, points are, are awarded to drivers based on their performance um, within a particular Grand Prix race. 
and the points that a, um, a driver earns are also aggregated by the team the driver drives for. So the points are, are conserved. Um, and the way we have quantities that can conserved, and we can often think about them in terms of uh, quantities that flow around a circuit. So um, this diagram is um, a sort of diagram referred to as a Sankey diagram, and um, originally developed for mapping energy flows. Um, but I've repurposed it here to show how we could have a flow of points flowing from different races to different drivers, and then from different drivers to different teams. And representing the data, now I could have represented this data as a tree map, but in this flow-based diagram, it provides me with a, a different set of visual tools in order to read this data. So um, at the right-hand side of the screen, we've got the different teams, which are aggregating points from their drivers. So we can see within a team which driver has, has earned the most points. By looking at a driver, we can see... Sorry, Tony, just to, sorry to interrupt here. I'm currently just seeing the if quantities are conserved slide with nothing oh, else on it right now. Image. Oh. Yeah, it's just a white white block above. Oh. Um, it's fine on mine, so that's odd. Um, um, I don't know how to undo that. Uh, what do you see now? Do you see an image now? Uh, unless it's just my screen, I'm still seeing the exact same image. No change on your on the slide. Uh, hang on. Do you get it now? Uh, no, still, no. See, still seeing the same slide. Oh, so you don't see a picture. I see. No, I just see the the image we saw at the bar, bar, start, which was the uh, blue blue bar with if quantities are conserved. And uh, I wonder how many of the. Uh, well, yeah. Um, okay, so there should be a picture of um, something known as a Sankey diagram. Um, I see it now coming up in the form of a Google image that you just searched for. So that is there. Okay, yeah, so I've just randomly searched for a Sankey diagram, not a particularly good one. Um, okay, so here's here's one. Okay, so do we have one now, a Sankey diagram here? So Yes. Um, right, so so these diagrams show show how things can flow. So if we've got a set of, of um, in the OU, one of the things we've been looking at is um, how uh, students might progress through different courses. Um, so different courses at different levels within a course. So they might take different modules within the first year, different modules within the second year, different models within the third year. We could use a Sankey diagram there. We've got student numbers um, being conserved or either flowing through courses or dropping out. We could use Sankey diagrams to represent the flow of populations across the different courses. Um, so again, these, these visual tools, um, different visual tools allow you to explore different sorts of properties. So tree maps allow us to explore hierarchical data sets, rearranging the hierarchies on the fly. Um, tools like Sankey diagrams allow us to look at the same sorts of data. We can arrange this data in a hierarchical form, but as a form of flow to see how, how things flow from one, one level to another level. And, and as we look at these different flows, um, we, we see different stories. So here, this is uh, just, uh, I'm not sure what this is of. Um, so carbon dioxide, methane, so gas production on the right-hand side, or gas use. Um, gas is being used in roads, commercial buildings, so different sorts of facilities, and those facilities are generating their carbon dioxide by different means. So commercial buildings are generating it from electricity and heat or fuel combustion, and this is all a category of energy contributing to carbon dioxide. Um, so these, these, these diagrams allow us to tell stories of flow. And putting, being able to put data into these diagrams allow us to read these these stories from them. Um, so that chart was missing. So one of the reasons we use um, images, again quoting Tukey, the picture examining eye is the best finder we have of the wholly unanticipated. When we're looking at data sets as sets of numbers or even summary statistics, quite often a lot of the actual intrigue is hidden within the detail of the data. 
Um, by expressing the data in a visual form, it allows us to spot patterns and structures more easily um, and, and spot surprising things within the data sets. So what different ways are there of looking at data? Many of us are familiar with, with typical chart styles we learned from school. So bar charts, column charts, even the dreaded pie chart, which is um, a badly misused chart. Um, and data tables as well. Data tables are a useful, valid way of looking at data, although they can be hard to make sense of if you've got millions of rows of data. In contrast, a visualization may help you look at a million data points and spot the odd one that's out quite quickly. Um, there's a wide variety of tools for generating charts. Um, when the data, when the tools for visualizing th these charts are uh, interactive tools, it allows us to explore the data in an interactive and dynamic way. Um, so this is a couple of examples of charts using, again, the Many Eyes tool. Um, here uh, we've got a, a, a histogram and a scatter plot, and we can select what the mapping from our data set, what, what columns go on to which axes are using drop down lists so we can have very quickly look at the same data set in a variety of different views just on the fly. Um, we can search within date within the data sets for particular data points and highlight them as shown in this top level. And when it comes to looking for outliers, here we've got a distribution of data points. Each block represents a different data point, and we're counting the number of data points that have got particular values. We can very easily see the outliers. We can see an outlier up here. We can see an outlier up down the bottom. So this was actually data from um, UK MPs' expenses data. Um, so this is the values of people claiming centrally purchased stationery. This person was claiming a lot this person had got a minus £2,000 rebate. So there's questions to be asked about the behavior of those two people. Um, so we can use charts to ask questions of data um, in a variety of ways. Um, and an underestimated and underused way is simply for counting and sorting things. So this chart was taken from a blog post on Cooling for Graphics blog a couple of weeks ago, um, which is um, showing um, sums donated for um, different causes looking at how the sizing of, of these different calls when you um, or when you size graphics according to a quantity square original graphic here showed the amount of people dying from a particular disease and the amount that was was being raised to spend on these diseases and connecting or using color to connect different sides of the chart and a line to connect items. So a political decision was taken, an infographic design decision was taken to sort each of these columns according to the biggest at the top and the smallest at the bottom. But that's not necessarily the most powerful way of telling that story. By sorting one of the by sorting the columns differently, in this case we've sorted the left column according to the values on the right we get a completely different way of reading this chart and a different story immediately jumps out at us that the, the relative sizes of the bubbles is far easier to compare. They're easier to compare because the things we're comparing are on the same row whereas here we're trying to make a comparison where things are dislocated in space. So the simple application of sorting in the original design someone had sorted on both columns the same way gives a different story and a very different way of, of just getting an immediate gut reaction gut response to the reading of this data set to the one we've got on the right hand side. Um, so just thinking about sorting data, quite often we see bar charts, column charts um, in reports and on tables where the columns are all higgledy-piggledy in a ragged way. But by sorting the data so that we've got decreasing columns for example or increasing columns or sorting on other dimensions, we may get very very different readings of the same chart. So the same chart, if we can sort the columns on a column chart or a bar chart, if we can sort the columns in two or three different ways, we may get two or three different charts 
from the, dang, the, from the same data set and from the same sort of chart. Simply the act of sorting changes our reading and our, our interpretation of the data. So when we're looking at, at data sets and when we're trying to make sense of them, when we're trying to um, interpret them, what sorts of things can we look for? And I'll just give a few examples of the sorts of things that I look for when I'm, I'm trying to explore a data set. We can look for outliers. Often sorting the data in different ways helps you see outliers um, that arise from different sortings. When we sort, we can find top threes, bottom threes. You know, we can, we can do simple rankings. We can find means and medians and look for the differences between them, which often tell us quite a lot about distributions. We can look for outliers. Now, oh, again, my chart has not rendered in here. This is a shame. Um, what I was going to show, uh, uh, okay. So when we're looking for outliers, I'll go back to that, looking for outliers, we can look for outliers on a, on a scatter plot, so the points that lies off at the extreme. In our chart here, we had an outlier at the top and an outlier at the bottom. There are different ways of thinking about how we can generate outliers. This is a set of time series data. Um, I apologize again, this is Formula One sports data, where we've got different rounds that uh, a particular driver was competing in and the position they scored. And what I was look, trying to look for here was outliers in terms of streaky behavior across different sets of drivers. So rather than an outlier being a single point, what I was trying to do was try to identify streaks where drivers had got particular were behaving in a particular way. So streaks in which they they were in placed in the top five. So we've got a streak of two, a streak of one, two, three, four, five, six, a streak of seven, then there was a gap, a streak of two, a streak of five. And what one thing that I was interested in was whether or not this streak of seven could in any sense be classed as an outlier. Was it unusual that this driver should get um, seven wins in a row? That's where we've got to start applying statistics. The point I wanted to make here from this point was that outliers may be occurrence that, that um, outliers may not be single points. Outliers may be constructed through analysis of, of looking at things over time. If we're looking at things over time, consecutive sequences, long runs, long streaks may actually be outliers and therefore of interest. Mm -hmm. And so one of the things we need to do when we're looking at time series data, possibly, is start looking at long run behaviors, sequences where behaviors are taking place in a particular way. In a learning sense, this might be patterns of behavior in test scores. If you've got a set of test scores from particular individuals, but they're taking regular tests over the course of a term or course of a year, we may well get different streaks in patterns of behavior, and there being able to analyze whether or not one streak is unusual or not could be a useful indicator of whether or not it's an outlier, whether or not it's an interesting point. So as well as looking for outliers, we can look for similarities and differences. Um, my, one of my charts is missing here, so I'll skip on to one. Um, this, this is um, from a set of data which was financial spending data. Um, and the, the spending data had got amounts being paid to companies and rebates from them. And what I was trying to look for, I'd noticed within this data, payments and, and anti-payments, so refunds being made to different companies. Um, and so this chart, taking the idea of the journeyman carpenter building our own tools, was constructed to try to, to find items visually where um, payments had been made and then refunded. So on here, I've got little black points and red, red diamonds, um, red triangles around them. Red triangles are payments that have been made as refunds on particular days, and the little small black dots are payments that have been made on a particular day. And where we get a red triangle, the red triangle is sized so that it sits over a black dot, we can see points at which we've got a payment made and a refund of made of exactly the same amount on the same day. And so we can start to look for, for similarities and differences within these payments, although here the similarities are between numbers that are positive and negative numbers. So this, a refund was made one amount on the same day.
some patients have no refunds associated with them. I was quite interested to see in this set of data just how one We can also split the data out. So tools allow us to split the data out. This was looking at a, a complete set of energy payments data set. Same data set had been split into electricity and gas payments. And visually, using a visual tool, it was quite easy to separate out that, that aggregated set of figures into ones that were electricity payments and ones that were gas payments to see whether or not there was different sorts of behavior between those two charts. Um, so there, that's tunneling down into the same data set as the original one, just by splitting it out into visual facets. Another way of exploring data is to look for trends. Um, so lots of data comes as time series. We quite often look at time series data over a timeline, so we've got a series of dates along the bottom. If we've got a series of dates along the bottom, we can quite often overlay different periods along the same axis. So these are a set of charts where I've got data sets from a particular set of numbers, doesn't particularly matter what, from three different years. The years are colored with different lines. And I've overlaid the data sets just to try to see whether or not there's similar patterns of behavior year on year. So if we'd looked at this as a set of a single timeline along the bottom of one year, then the second year, then the third year, we'd see the up, down, up, down, up down behavior within the data set. Overlaying the data on the same chart, likely up to, we can terms of behavior within months by year. So in this chart, I've got separate columns for each month of the year, and there are different streaks within the months corresponding to different years. And here we can see how the data is acting within a month across years and also across the whole year. So within the month of January we see a particular trend in behavior, within February we see a trend in behavior, across the year we see a trend in behavior. And this data set, these big jumps between the patterns of behavior in the middle of each month suggest that the way this data was being calculated has changed. Um, so the data has been rebased from a set of values down here to a set of values up here. So this was actually, I think, job seekers um, allowance figures in the in the Isle of Wight, and there was a recalculation of how those numbers were generated midway through the data set that I've displayed here. Um, other ways of looking for patterns and structures on maps. Lots of data set makes sense when viewed. Um, when viewed on a map. This was a, a map I generated a long time ago based on MPs expenses data again. It was travel expenses data. The data was typically represented within uh, just a table and sorted by sorted according to the value of, of expenses that had been claimed. So someone would look at the data set and say one um, MP had claimed more than someone else and therefore, you know, there was something suspicious about that. But when we rebase the data by looking at it geographically, by plotting MPs, how much they claim for travel expenses based on where their constituencies were, we could start to see whether or not they were claiming amounts that were um, at odds with not only their neighbors, well, at odds mainly with their neighbors. People on this map, the, the markers are colored according to how much someone claimed. The color reflects the value. And we see that people tend to claim the same as their neighbours, more or less, and they're claiming more the further away they get from Westminster and the further away they get from London. There are a couple of odd um, outliers in there. There's a little red dot right in the middle there, someone claiming a large amount. There's a little outlier, there's a red one in the middle there as well. So these are MPs claiming significantly more than, uh, than their neighbours, which is odd possibly, and is you know, something we would look at for a further question. But if we just sorted the data according to the uh, amount that people had claimed, we might have missed those outliers. They might not have been you know, in the top 10 of claims, but they are odd when compared to their neighbors. So how do you find out your neighbors? You want to make comparisons between data points that are neighboring in some way, but what does neighboring mean? Different definitions of neighboring will give us different patterns of behavior. 
Another way of looking at data, um, this is a network graph. This was generated using a tool called Gephi. Um, and this shows the, the structure of, um, of followers of a particular Twitter account um, where each of the dots, each of the names is, is a different Twitter, um, uh, Twitter ID. And I've grouped um, these Twitter IDs according to ones that follow each other. So Twitter IDs that, that follow each other or tend to follow each other are all, all grouped closely. And when we see this sort of network diagram, it's often referred to as a hairball when we, we see the, the lines connecting the points. It can be hard to read. People think they just look like a mess. When we color them appropriately and we, and we, we lay them out um, according to spacing points so that people who connect to each other, people who follow each other are placed in similar locations, we start to get charts such as these that we can read of read as if they were maps. So we're all familiar with reading geographical maps. We can start to read these network diagrams themselves as maps and different areas of the networks represent, in this case, Twitter people. It's people who share similar sorts of interests by virtue of following each other. So we can read these network diagrams as maps. Quite often when people see them, they just see them as, as sort of messes. But when we start to think of them in terms of geography and like things being close to like things, we can get a different sense of reading them. Um, I'll skip that one. Um, so finally, I realize the time has, has moved on. I just wanted to talk about how we go about creating these charts. Now, again, writing 50 or so years ago, Tukey wrote, the hand drawing of graphs, except perhaps reproduction in books and in some journals, is now economically wasteful, slow, and on the way out. Tools were becoming available, computational tools were becoming available, actually this was written more recently than 50 years ago, um, in order to allow the creation of charts. So what sorts of tools allow us to do that? Uh, one of the tools that I use for generating charts and creating charts, different chart types on the fly, um, is um, the R statistical programming language um, and a graphics library within that called ggplot. And what ggplot allows us to do is just take a data set, a data table, and um, using the idea of uh, the grammar of graphics, I mentioned Lee Wilkinson right at the start of this presentation, um, it's a grammar for describing the construction of charts um, based on the claim that if we follow the grammar we should not be able to create charts that um, don't make sense, so we should always be able to create meaningful charts. And the way we create charts is that we, we, we create a chart object, a GT plot chart object, and then we apply um, operations to the data within it. So um, in this I've, I've um, applied a whole variety of different operations to construct this chart. And this chart, we can read the construction of the chart. So I've started off by using something called a stat sum, which has summed up the, we've got a count of data points, and it's summing up the count of data points with a particular value. Um, so I've got a set of values along the bottom D1, a set of values along the x, y axis D2. Um, I'm counting up the number that, where we've got D1 equal to naught, the number of D2 equals 15, counting those and then sizing a dot using a statistic called stats. Uh, um, these lines are um, linear regressions. So these are, are regressions based on the data points, and I've created that using a stat smooth. So stat smooth means that I want to create this smooth best fit line around these red data points. So this line is generated by data points at the top and a couple of data points down the bottom. Um, I've got a couple of geon lines. Um, so these are the red dotted line and the blue dotted line. They were each constructed by a separate um, line object. I've got another statistic, which is an AB line. The X equals Y line has been added to this chart. Um, and there's a couple of other little dotted charts in there. So this chart has been written. It wasn't, it wasn't generated using wizards or drop-down menus. It was written. So it was written. It can be read visually. And we can also read the construction of it. This chart was created by executing the lines of code. And this, this chart is a, is a novel chart type developed to try to make sense of these particular data sets. So I was trying to look about whether or not these data sets, the, the, the 
blue lines are meaningful, the red dashed line is meaningful, whether or not the, the distribution of points had a particular set of properties. So this, this was a tool constructed um, for me to help me read and understand this data set. Here's another tool. This, this tool, oops, this tool again is showing a dot plot where we're with the size of the circles, accounts of the values of where the D1 and D2 values have, have taken a particular combination. So we've got a large number of things at this point 510, a large number at this point which is 39, a few or just, just a singleton at the point 615. And this chart was constructed again using ggplot. Um, using this stat sum, this thing that counts up the number of occurrences of points at a, a particular xy value, and the data came from um, a query onto a database. And again, I've I've constructed the chart on a set of data that came from a query on a database. Again, this was all written, so it can be it can be it becomes reproducible. Um, the data, we know where the data came from, we know how the data object was constructed, and then we know how the chart object was constructed. And I think one of the things that we need to start doing more of when we're working with data sets is producing these reproducible scripts that we can that we can read um, that we can read as, as scripts, that we can read as analyses, and that are also constructive in the sense that they construct the data charts um, from the text. So we need ways of recording conversations. And just to finish off with a couple of tools that I use for as environments for, for doing these sorts of reproducible analyses. Um, one is a tool called R Studio, which is used for working with the R programming language. So the, the charts that were shown previously were generated with the R programming language. And we can we can write analyses within these environments and we can generate PDF documents. We can generate documents that are prettily styled like this from within the environment. Um, and another set of tools that I've been working with are called um, IPython Notebooks. And this is a, a notebook style um, environment where we, we have separate cells, so different cells where we can write code, we can write text, we can execute code and and by executing the code, the results of executing the code are, are placed within the data set. So in this cell, I, I was doing um, a sorting operation on the data set. I executed that code, and it prints the output of my operation. I've written some text. Then I write the chart I want to draw. I hit generates the output. In the tools out there. Um, I apologize for the higgledy piggledy nature of this presentation. Um, there's a, there's a lot of ways, uh, there's a lot of tools that allow us to build tools that are becoming increasingly easy to use. There's a lot of tools that are power tools that if we take the time to learn how to use them, allow us to construct and find that, that a lot of the time we're not necessarily embracing them. We're sticking with tools that allow point and click wizards possibly for the construction of charts, but we don't necessarily remember how we construct those charts. What we should I think what well, there is, I think, utility in moving towards models where we start to write charts and record the construction of charts and then generate those charts as tools um, when working with data of whatever sort. Um, so, again, apologies for the, the scattergun nature of that presentation. Hopefully there were odd little bits that were intriguing or useful to you. Um, everything I, I play with or explore um, ends up at some point or other on the useful info blog. Um, so feel free to read there. Feel free to ask questions, comments on any of the posts that appear there. And feel free as well to challenge me, heckle me, hassle me, uh, chase me to explain things in more detail or, or give you clues as to how to work with your own data on Twitter at Psychomedia. Great. Well, thanks very much, Tony, and certainly appreciate you taking the time to do this. We did have a few little glitches uh, technically, but at I this point... Yeah, for that. 
my uh, my general view is, uh, you know, if you're doing things online, it's uh, you know, glitches are part of the territory. It's not always the best approach, but at least you have to have some tolerance for those. So I thought it was a great overview. Um, you. The, the story or the view of having conversations with data I think is a compelling one and much of what we're looking at as the course progresses is exactly that kind of idea and the realization that uh, as many tools as are available ultimately it's the kinds of stories you're trying to tell with your data that matters most and I think you've done a great job mirroring what that activity is about. I did tweet your link uh, to your, your blog and I'll also drop uh, a note into it into the uh, newsletter as it goes out tomorrow. Any other links that you might want me to use if you decide that you're on, uh, if you want to open up your email, I think it's uh, roughly a quarterly thing for you to check your email. but. Uh, oh. Not that frequent. <laughs> okay, so, uh, so let me know any other links that you're just tweeting as well, and I'll drop them in and share them with others in the group. So again, thanks very much for taking the time to chat with us, and I hope you have a great rest of the evening. And for the rest of you, uh, thanks all for joining in.